Welcome to the Towards a More Sustainable Supply Chain panel today. We really appreciate your time and look forward to sharing from some of our very engaging uh, and thought-provoking leaders in this space. So I'm Susan Beersley. I'll be your host today. I'm with ABI Research and I lead our freight transportation and logistics service. Um, today we're going to be talking about that despite a very complex 2020, how our leaderships really champion sustainability and really understand how companies are transitioning towards a net zero economy really across the value chains. And then to understand the importance of closing the loop on product cycles from the design stage all the way to the end, including reuse. Uh, and so that's really what we'll be covering with our esteemed uh, panelists today. Um, so with that, I appreciate your time and I'm going to have each of the panelists introduce themselves, uh, starting with Jason. Hello everyone, my name is Jason Ryman and I lead the global supply chain here at the Hershey Company. The Hershey Company is making great tasting snacks globally and we have iconic brands such as Hershey, Reese's, icebreakers and skinny pop. Now we're in a business of making moments of goodness for our consumers. And we've been doing that for 126 years. And we live that purpose every day by doing well, by doing good. Thank you. Um, Abe. Uh, thank you, Susan. Uh, I'm Abe Eskenazi, currently the CEO for uh, ASCM, the Association of Supply Chain Management. Uh, the organization's tax exempt uh, organization membership with about 45,000 members uh, across the globe with 300 partners in over 40 countries. Um, most of our focus is on certification of uh, supply chain professionals from entry level to mid career to senior leadership positions in organizations. Our work encompasses not only working with organizations on their supply chain transformation and implementation, but it also focuses on benchmarking and reporting out. Uh, the other aspect of our work is in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, where we work with the Gates Foundation on uh, last mile delivery of essential medicine, vaccines, and family planning products in five countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. So we're focused on uh, supply chain and more importantly, a better world through supply chain. And we believe that we can do so for consumers and patients alike. And a uh, pleasure to be on the call today with all the uh, colleagues. Thank you, Abe. Fantastic, Laura. Hi, my name is Laura Nador, and I'm the president of Chef North America and BXB Digital for Brandwoods. Um, I've been with, with the company for 17 years and working across a number of different regions, including Europe and, and Latin America. And, uh, and before that, I used to work for a Fortune 500 logistics company. Um, I, I want to give you a few fun facts about my company, because I know that some of my fellow panelists here, Jason, maybe Carlos, will know a lot about Chef and Brambles, but some others will not. So CHIP helps companies move more goods to more people in more places than any other organization on earth. And, and we have a circular business model actually that facilitates sharing and reusing of the largest pool of reusable pallets, crates, and containers. And we have an astonishing number, more than 330 million of them that are constantly moving across more than 60, uh, 60 countries. So uh, we do serve the, the biggest brands, but also the small brands, 24,000 lots a week. Uh, we serve uh, about 14,000 manufacturing sites here in North America alone, and about 100,000 stores and distribution centers and retail. And the one thing that we are proud uh, of is being sustainability pioneers. Because of this circular share and reuse model that we have, nothing goes to waste. Uh, with Chip and Brambles, nothing goes to waste. Um, and right now, um, we are engaging or, or actually committing ourselves to a higher ambition, which is to pioneer regenerative supply chains. And we're going to be net positive by 2025. So thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you, Susan. And, and I'm really honored to be sharing this panel with, uh, with such incredible supply chain professionals. Thank you. Thank, thank you. And that certainly is an incredibly um, admirable and um, very high goal setting. So we appreciate that that. Uh, Carlos, I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much. And uh, hello, everybody. <clears throat> Carlos Valderrama, and I'm uh, the head of customer success at Lamasoft. That means uh, my team and I are working constantly on making sure that all of our customers, uh, one of them, Laura, and the chef as well, are highly successful and create value with our technologies. 
um, at Llamasoft. What we do is basically we're the premier supply chain AI uh, software solution company. We have over um, 600 customers globally that uh, leverage our solutions to be able to enhance the ways that they're um, making their decisions uh, through supply chain. Um, I've been in supply chain for uh, pretty much all my uh, my uh, professional uh, life, helping companies determine their uh, overall supply chain strategies and the overall supply chain design. And uh, as an interesting fact, I mean, yes, we're llamas, and uh, you can see I have uh, my own uh, llama Dolores in the back over there. So very happy to be here. Very happy to share the panel here with um, with all of you, uh, great supply chain executives, and to talk about sustainability is something I'm really passionate about. Thank you, Carlos, and we look forward to hearing more from you. So from there, let's go to Gert. Yeah, hi, my name is uh, Gert Silvest. Uh, I'm co-founder of, of TradeShift, uh, a company um, that, that digitizes trade. Um, so our mission is to, uh, to fight uh, fake digitization. Uh, we build a global uh, network that digitizes the fundamental trade transactions. Uh, for, for very large corporates and, and their supply chains. So literally everything from uh, procurement to, to payment. Uh, we are also an open network. So, um, so we are moving uh, uh, $750 billion in, in transaction volume. We have 2.5 million companies in the network. And, and we are open for partners to write uh, apps on, on top of this network, which takes us into a lot of different spaces, uh, including uh, sustainability. Uh, so doing things like carbon footprinting, uh, risk assessments and supply chains and so on. Uh, I'd say we're very much a technology company. So um, the way that we de deliver financial services and insights in supply chain on, on spend and, and, and risk and so on is based on, on data, our ability to connect all these companies. And, and we employ, we have heavy users of, of uh, AI and machine learning uh, and these kind of approaches uh, leveraging all, all the all the insights we have in, in the network. Excellent. Thank you, Gert. So I think what we'll do now is we'll start on our, our questions for the panel. So the first question is, what are some of the challenges for end-to-end -end sustainability? So we're going to go back to Gert uh, and then work our way around um, backwards where we started with the intros. OK. Yeah, so so I think one of the key challenges is is definitely lack of insights, as as I guess we also hear around the table here. Uh, a lot of companies have set uh, very uh, high goals for 2025, 2030, and beyond. Uh, we know the Paris Agreement um, has a goal of, of basically halving the emissions every 10 years. So I think there are enough challenges, but I, I think one of the the challenges of of actually achieving this kind of exponential reduction in, in our footprint is that we are not applying exponential technologies to this. And what I mean by that is that if I look at the B2B space, uh, contrary to, to e-commerce or in the personal space, I think we see a, a huge absence of digitization. And, and we are still in a, in a world where only 10% of all the invoices that are being moved between companies are, are digital today. So, so something is going to give, and if you lack digitization, it will be very hard to understand what, ex what is actually happening in the supply chain. I think today you have less than a thousandth of a percent of companies that actually report on CO2 emissions in the extended supply chain. And I think until we solve how to digitize those relationships and exchange data on our footprinting, then it's going to be very, very difficult. But I also think the upsides are, are very big. Um, you know, I, I saw a, a great interview uh, or session. It was at a conference with the Unilever CPO where he talked about that there are sustainable brands were on average growing uh, around, I think it was 35% had a higher uh, growth rate compared to, to non-sustainable brands. So, so there are a lot of upsides there as well. Um, and the good thing and the interesting thing is that I think companies actually have a lot of the assets that could help them drive that transparency. Um, so, so for example, looking into everything that exists in the uh, accounting system or ERP systems and order systems actually can provide a lot of uh, insights into to what is the real footprint of companies. If only we could break down the silos between uh, 
uh, buyers and, and sellers and, and share some of that information across the supply chain. I think companies could could get the help to 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 use their investments right and then invest in the right places in the supply chain where it actually makes a difference on 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 the footprint. I think that's a really good point, uh, Gerd, of breaking down the silos. I, I think that is really one of the keys to un unlocking what, what we need uh, within and across corporations. So thank you for that. Uh, Carlos, how about you? Yeah, <clears throat> definitely an interesting uh, topic. Um, I was thinking about uh, a, a year ago, we had a chance to do um, a study with uh, the Economist Intelligence Unit around sustainability. And we had an interviewed around uh, 250, a little bit over 250 executives around the world. And it was very interesting because we asked something very similar around uh, challenges on end-to-end -end sustainability, being able to look at the end-to-end -end spectrum of the supply chain and even go into suppliers of suppliers and customers of customers to a certain extent. And there were four things that I thought were, were pretty interesting there. The first one was um, the design. Right, so supply chains are designed or have been a historical, I would call it in some cases, like a historical accident. And uh, right now they're structured in a particular way, but they're not necessarily engineered to be able to have all these multiple objectives. You would have the objective of minimizing cost or being efficient and the objective of being sustainable, which might not necessarily be opposing. I mean, they could be complementary, but you have to have that into account when you have that design. The second part is even if you have the design, then when you're actually operating, uh, making sure that everybody in the organization and the, and, um, the um, adjunct organizations uh, are knowledgeable about what sustainability is and what uh, the trade-offs are and what it actually implies. And even within your own organization, I mean, making sure that everybody's in the same page or on the same page or on the same understanding of, of uh, uh, that goal or those goals that you have in sustainability so that even at a tactical level, they can make those um, decisions. And then the fourth thing that we that we that we identified is um, the real understanding of the trade-offs. So to give you an example, I mean there could be a redesign of the supply chain where we're thinking of setting a new uh, facility, and there are multiple options or locations for the facility. Let's say that the facility actually requires water to be able to produce the product. So there's going to be an impact to the ecosystem if we have a facility that is closer to the best reservoir of water versus having it at a different location where you don't have that impact, but there could be more costs implied on the location. So the question is, how do you actually trade those off? Right? If you were having those two different alternatives, how do you actually balance the decision? How do you make sure that the organization understands that there's a trade of there and that it's, it's worthwhile evaluating all those different aspects. Those were like the four main things that, that I thought were, were interesting as challenges to be able to get to that end-to-end -end sustainability. Pretty sure that there's a number of, of them. I mean, as Gerd was pointing out, technology and visibility are, are, are definitely key, key components there, being able to see what is going on today so that you can try to look at the, at the overall trade-offs. But, uh, but those were the ones that, uh, that I thought I we want to bring up and highlight and see what uh, everybody else thinks about. Excellent, Carlos. I appreciate that. And I think especially this year, people have realized truly understanding end to end for the supply chain all the way down to raw materials. And I think that's created uh, surprises, if you will, in, in some companies. And then in addition, the, the trade-offs. I think there's a whole entirely new set of trade-offs as well as ones that have existed for a long time that haven't been um, perhaps addressed by some companies. So appreciate that. And I'm going to turn it over to Laura. Okay. Um, yeah, I think uh, I would agree with uh, with a lot of what you uh, you both just said. So in our case, I'm talking about some of the complexity that Carlos was alluding to, uh, we need to consider that we, we operate in a, in a large number of countries and regions. So more than 60 countries, very different levels of maturity, um, infrastructure, uh, supply chain development. And we have to guarantee that we have sustainable sourcing and responsible operations across the globe. So that's, that's one big thing. It's also very important for us to understand the market complexity, each market complexity. So for example, if I just look at the US where we are today, um, we have production and consumption centers geographically dispersed, right? So this creates for us in, in our circular model, geographic imbalance. I have a lot of our pallets getting issued to manufacturing or processing sites 
in the Midwest or in the central region of the US. And then they ship to uh, thousands and thousands of stores across uh, the West Coast or the East Coast or Florida. You know? So the products are purchased by consumers over there with uh, demographic concentration is. So that's where we need to collect all of our empty platforms. They end up there and we have to return them to condition them to our sites. So that circular model on a, on a national scale requires a very sophisticated reverse logistics engine that we have. And we as an organization have to focus a lot, a lot on network optimization to ensure that we move those assets the minimum number of miles possible to minimize that, that footprint on the environment. Uh, that's, you know, lamas of guys uh, here in the panel, they know a lot about what we do to do that and to keep the flexibility in our network, making those trade-offs and those decisions about optimization with sustainability at the core, right? Uh, at the same time that we have to warranty product availability always for our customers and the best level of service. Another key challenge, and I think, you know, going back to what Gert was saying um, around insights and data and, and digitization, one of the key challenges for us is keeping track of the assets. Because remember, we issue our platforms out to manufacturers, uh, and then they, share, they get shared and reused by multiple, multiple other users. So they, they, they change hands out in the field. So it's really important for us to have visibility of the data. Yeah, it's all about the data. And I would say, um, um, I would agree with Gert in some of the comments, organizations that are looking to move from their linear economy type of models into a circular model have to constantly ask themselves that question. Where are my assets, right? Where are those assets? How can I recover them and redeploy them faster? And how do I do it while still increasing transfer, transfer efficiency? Because it's not good if you're going to have um, an increase in CO2 emissions um, as a result. And what we have done is actually almost declare a war on empty miles. So as a company, we hate seeing trucks that go half empty or yeah. transporting air on the roads. And there's a lot of that happening in the US. And we try to help our customers by collaborating on transport because of where we are in the supply chain, we're in the middle of you know, everything uh, and the density and the size that we have. And the fact that our products normally go in the opposite direction to CPG products, finished products. So we can find many opportunities to, uh, to have synergies and, and reduce CO2 footprint by um, increasing collaborative transport. I tell you, in the US, 28% of all the miles travel empty. So this is not just a sustainability concern or sustainability challenge, but it's also a real saving opportunity. When we were talking about trade-offs, there's real money behind that. And then I would say, finally, uh, for us, it is very, very important. I think for anybody playing in the circular economy, it's very important to understand how your customers and how your partners and your suppliers prioritize sustainability in their supply chains and in their decision-making process. Uh, that, that will drive a lot of the action, right? So we are privileged to have the largest and the leading edge brands as our main customers. And normally they understand the, the urgency behind sustainability and, and it's high in the strategic agenda. Thank you, Lauren. I thought she brought up several fantastic points. I think one of them, as we continue to see exponential growth in online sales and e-commerce, that's changed the nature of the distribution network. Um, so micro-fulfillment centers, for example, and all, all sorts of different options for, for last mile. And then reverse logistics. I don't think nearly enough companies outside of these companies understand, uh, for one, the fact that um, somewhere around 30% or so of these online orders end up going into uh, reverse logistics channels. So I think that's incredibly um, relevant, all, all these points that you mentioned. And the fact that things that we ant some companies anticipated happening in five years have happened this year in a matter of months or weeks. So the ability to not just react. And then I guess your last point, the freight as a service of really uh, cargo optimization, for example, I think that's another very relevant point when it comes to sustainability. Um, and we see such a bifurcation of very full loads and very closer to empty loads. And so the ability to really address that with you and your company, Laura, I think is uh, incredibly challenging, but incredibly important. So thank you for that. So with that, I'm gonna move on to Abe. 
Thanks, Susan. Uh, yeah, the, the, I want to expand on a couple of the points that uh, the team maker, Carlos and Laura made. Obviously, those are key to um, some of the challenges. But I think we need to step back a little bit, and I think we need to define what sustainability means. If you ask a supply chain professional, if you ask a CEO, if you ask an operations professional, what does sustainability mean to them? You're going to find that almost in every industry or in every function, you're going to get a different definition of what sustainability means to these individuals and to the organization. So I think at an organizational level, you need to define what sustainability means to your organization. It is it economic, is it environmental, is it ethical? It should be all of them, but which is more emphasized for the organization? And and going back to Laura's point, different geographies are going to drive different sustainability objectives for the organization. So the flexibility, it is not a one size fits all. And that's what's challenging a lot of organizations is that sustainability means different parts in your organization in different parts of the globe, especially with your team. So that's first. Secondly, we need to focus on visibility and transparency within the supply chain and beyond the tier one vendors or your tier one yes. suppliers. And I think this is part of the challenge that a lot of organizations have. And going back to Gert's point, it could be addressed with digital transformation and a lot of technology, but oftentimes the trade-off in terms of investment in these technologies is not focused on sustainability. It's often focused on other metrics for the organization, specifically with the technology investment. Um, next, collaboration and partnerships with your suppliers. You need to hold them accountable to the same aspects that you hold yourself accountable for. Otherwise, there is very little consistency that you're going to have across the organization, especially in implementation. And then lastly, I want to focus on talent development. You need to ensure that your team and the vendors and your organization has consistently trained your individuals on what sustainability means to them, and more importantly, the trade-offs that uh, were brought up before. Um, this is not a, a single solution that you're going to see. For um, example, as Carlos was pointing out in, uh, with the water example, you also have it with energy. If you're going to move away from you know, fossil fuels, it's going to have an impact on that industry. So it's not a, you know, a binary switch. We'll just go to different types of you know, energy sources and we're not going to use fossil fuels anymore. Well, that's going to have a dramatic impact on an entire industry. So the question of trade-offs goes beyond a lot of the internal activities, and it's a more macro environment issue you know, for the, the markets as well as for the environment. So these are just some of the challenges, uh, again, um, echoing a lot of what the other panelists have laid on. Thank you, Abe, and I think you really did a great job uh, elaborating on these deep complexities and how broad that really goes. So thank you for that, and I'm gonna turn it over to Jason. Yeah, thank you. I think there's been a lot of great comments here about, you know, the complexities. And I think one of the things that we're realizing is just how complex, you know, supply chains are. And we're getting better and better visibility to that, especially when we talk about going through, you know, tiers of our, you know, supplier and supplier networks. So from my standpoint, I always tell people to, you know, take a step back and just think about and picture, you know, what it takes to make a simple chocolate bar. And think about the millions of farmers around the world who are shipping to you know, tens and thousands of suppliers, all the different materials to convert at one of our plants somewhere around the world to then ship to customers, eventually get into millions of consumers. And this has to happen in repetition, you know, every day. So when a consumer goes to purchase it, you know, it's available. And, you know, that's the complexity of what we're, we're orchestrating and having that right visibility to it is critical and making sure that you understand all those different impacts. And in today's like globally connected ecosystem, you really have to understand you know, what's happening with all the different stakeholders there. So what's happening with your suppliers, what's happening with your customers, what's happening with government and government organizations, as well as civil society as an activist, you know, we have to make sure that we work together to bring you know, holistic solutions to help meet all those needs. Take two different ingredients for us to make a chocolate bar. Cocoa, it's only grown in you know, several regions you know, around the world uh, and it's a, you know, a lot longer supply chain uh, and it has a lot less infrastructure uh, than maybe our fluid milk, which has to come within a hundred miles of you know, our, our main chocolate factory. So they're, they're very different uh, complexities and there's very uh, unique uh, challenges that are faced with each of those different supply chains. 
And I think uh, you, you, you know, I heard Abe hit it. I heard Carlos hit it. And you know, Laura, uh, you know, her, you know, these are the challenges that we face. And I think that what we're seeing now is is people, you know, looking at it and saying, how do we make the impact that we can make by ensuring better visibility and transparency to what's happening within our supply chain? Excellent. Thank you, Jason. So we're actually going to stay with you, Jason, and move on to the next question of how do you integrate sustainability for your suppliers, your company, and your customers? So you started talking a little bit about it, but if you could expand on that for a few minutes, we'd appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the things that is really about the approach that we take. Uh, obviously, you know, we're here to make sure that we're meeting the needs of our consumers and first hearing about what their needs and concerns are. But it's really about looking at you know, all the different stakeholders. And I think there's a part of it's around the, the approach. Uh, so if we just go to our suppliers and say, hey, we need you to do this, it, we have to have a different approach to it and say, hey, what do you need from us to help accomplish, you know, uh, you know impact on climate change or, or sustainability or, you know, living, you know, wages, you know, for farmers? You know, what is going to be needed from us and how do we help? And I think that, that forms a different type of, of partnership. One of the things that I'm excited about is that we're actually you know, on the journey of setting our science-based targets uh, initiative. And we'll be actually announcing that in early 2021. And the team has really been looking at you know, the impact of our direct supply chain through scope one, you know, the scope two impact of some of the indirect that we're responsible, for, but also looking at the scope three and upstream and downstream and where those impacts are. And that allows us to really understand you know, where the priorities should be set and then how do we you know, make sure that we have the, the right initiatives to go make the biggest impact we can make? And that's one of the things that we stress you know, with our team here is, you know, how are we actually making the biggest impact you know, that we can make? And you know, where should those priorities be? Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. So I, I think that level of detail is absolutely going to serve as uh, one of the leadership positions in, in the industry. So thank you. And I'm going to turn it over to Abe now. Uh, thanks, Susan. And uh, Jason, you're, you're dead on. Um, it, I would elevate the discussion a little bit more of the board level engagement. Uh, I think the board needs to establish their criteria for holding the management accountable in the organization. So let's start at that level. And secondly, performance metrics. Let's make sure that we're measuring. And I love what Jason was pointing out, science-based data. How about it? How about that we listen to science and then we make decisions based on relevant factual information? So I think that would be a great start. More importantly, organizational learning. Nobody's going to get it right the first time. More importantly, see this as a journey as opposed to a destination for your sustainability objectives that you're going to get better, you're going to learn, but more importantly, you've got to disseminate that learning across the organization so that you can take advantage of the opportunities that you have. Uh, additionally, walk the talk. There are very few organizations that won't say that sustainability is part of their organization's objectives and that they're accountable. Well, let's report out, let's get the benchmarking, let's get the consistency in reporting on what sustainability means to those organizations. More importantly, within the industry. Food industry is going to have a different metric on sustainability than electronics, than auto, than aerospace. Let's identify what those industry level metrics are consistently for those industries and have organizations report. And I think this is where associations can play a role because we're representatives of the industry. So we need to get the feedback from those organizations to establish those metrics so that we can hold ourselves accountable to the industry and to the general public about what sustainability means to your organization, whether it's UN Global Compact or Circular Economy. There are a variety of different metrics in the marketplace. We don't need to invent a whole lot more. The industries have a pretty good handle on it. And then lastly, um, flexibility and redundancy in your system. Uh, this is not, as uh, Jason was pointing out, each of their organizational business units has a different objective and may have a different sustainability performance metric. So let's be flexible and ensure that we are reporting consistently across the enterprise and more importantly, across the industry. I think that would go a long way to limit the number of challenges that we have with sustainability and the impact that it has on consumers, patients, and the globe, um, obviously. 
Sorry, excellent, Abe. Um, so you brought up a number of good points, but certainly I think one of them of setting these goals, but then being able to look back and learn from those and adjust uh, in that journey. I think that's incredibly valuable. And then the board involvement. I think those are a few really mm -hmm. good points. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Laura. Yeah, thank you, Susan. I actually have to say, I couldn't agree more uh, with the points uh, just raised um, a moment ago by Abe and the importance of involving the highest levels in the organization and the board itself directly in those discussions. We find actually that uh, it's not just consumers that want a lot more, investors are asking for a lot more in terms of uh, sustainability yes. credentials from the companies they invest in. Uh, so consumers are more active, uh, they're, 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 there's a lot more activism going on, but society as a whole, including uh, that investor community, is, is expecting a lot more from companies, especially uh, from the big brands, you know, the big names uh, that tend to be our customers um, for Chep and Brambles. So over the past five years, um, we, Brambles and Chep, have focused our, our goals, our sustainability goals, um, and very data-driven goals, on being better for the planet, for the communities, and for the business. That was our, our, our focus. Um, and we're proud that, that we achieved a lot. So in, in, in 2020, we closed uh, our five-year cycle uh, achieving 100% certified sustainable sources for, for all of our timber globally, and timber is our, is our biggest uh, element, raw material. Uh, we achieved 33% reduction in CO2 emissions per unit delivered in scope one and two, uh, which was versus a target of 20%. So we were very happy to, to overachieve that. And we achieved more than 30% uh, leadership positions held by women, which was also part of, uh, part of, our, of our agenda. Uh, and we're, we're already proud of this, but we decided we want to raise our ambitions. So in 2025, we actually uh, already launched a new sustainability targets, which include our commitment to, to enable regenerative supply chains. So restoring nature. Uh, our largest commitments uh, in order to become net positive at 25 include uh, sustainable growing two trees for every one that we use so that we can restore uh, forest mass uh, in the planet. Um, we, uh, we will be climate positive by ensuring that 100% of the energy we use will be renewable totally, and that all of our operations are going to be carbon neutral globally. Um, uh, and we're also um, uh, very keen to advocate, educate, and impact a million people to become circular economy change makers. Um, we, wow. we believe that, that that thought leadership you know, has, to, has to increase. We have to be pushing the bar there in terms of getting more people to become change makers. Um, we also believe that our, our circular business model already is active uh, in, in many supply chains, more than 60,000 customer supply chains. And that allows us to actually help those partners, customers and suppliers uh, to actually improve their, uh, their sustainability too. And, and we can tackle some of those big shared challenges together. So last year uh, in Detroit at the Sustainable Brands, we actually launched our Zero Waste World program, which actually was about listening first to the biggest brands, so the 75 top brands uh, around the globe and all of the top retailers, and, and listen to their pain points in terms of what they were trying to achieve sustainability-wise. And we found out uh, there were three main um, issues or challenges. Uh, the first one was the need to eliminate waste, big, big challenge. The second one was about eradicating empty transfer miles. I, I touched on this a moment ago. And the third one was um, cutting out inefficiencies. And, and since we launched this, uh, we've been working with 250 customers already, and we plan to double the number of collaborations in the next five years. Uh, and that work already uh, includes, it's, it's, a, it's a broad range of initiatives, actually. We're working on both sides of the, of the supply chain, both ends, uh, starting with the raw materials uh, and, and, and helping those customers actually reduce the need for single use packaging and going into reuse a lot more. Um, and also supporting retailers on the other end uh, of the supply chain in their ambition to turn that waste that at the end of the tunnel uh, become valuable results. So, so what we're doing is um, um, R&D activity and, and we are actually working hard to lock up waste making that turn, uh, you know, the single use plastics that are used for packaging, consumer, consumer packaging, into long life reusable products. For example, you know, plastic pallets that would contain recycled or upcycled material. So it's exciting, a, a lot of work going on. 
Thank you, Laura. Um, really appreciate it. First, the ambitious goals, and then obviously the goals that you reached and or exceeded are fantastic. And I think the other point that was so important is you talked about listening first. So really listening and understanding um, as, as a critical step. So thank you for that. Fantastic to hear. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Carlos. Yeah, definitely fantastic to hear, <clears throat> Laura. That was uh, that was that was very very interesting, very exciting for you guys. Um, I wanted to <clears throat> to add a couple of more things. I mean, I'm I'm pretty much in in uh, pretty much in alignment with everything that uh, the other panelists have mentioned. Uh, from our experience, I mean, one of the things that we've seen arise on as more investors are interested in sustainability is in companies looking at joint designs of their supply chains. So we're talking about collaboration. They mentioned that as, as, as well as, as Laura on, on putting all these uh, different pieces together and even looking at collaborating with competitors to a certain extent, right? Like, if, I don't know if you guys remember, but back in 2002 in Europe, there was this uh, big recycling problem with um, high-tech um, uh, appliances. And then there was this company that was created, ERP was the name of the company. I think it's European uh, Recycling Platform or something of the sort between Hewlett Packard and Electrolux and Sony and Braun to start to put together their supply chains to do the recycling in a more systematic way and be able to leverage the scale or the benefits of scale. Even though they might be competing in some of the, of the different segments, it actually ended up uh, providing a, an additional benefit for the supply chain as, as well as balancing the environmental impact at the same time. And those types of, of, of changes in the supply chain, I mean, those are dramatic changes on, on how you set up your overall supply chain end to end, on how you would align with your different customers to like make those pickups, for example, um, and where you align with your suppliers as well to be able to return those uh, products and, in, and the components of it and be able to, to, to negotiate those things and do it in a very collaborative uh, way. So um, we've helped a number of, of companies in doing those types of redesigns. And now that, uh, that, uh, that this push on sustainability is, is coming um, from, from the top down, <clears throat> it becomes an even more relevant uh, type of practice. So um, the first thing when you do that design, that's the, the other point that I wanted to bring up is, is being able to, to do this mapping of the supply chain. And it sounds very simple, right? And when you say, going to do the mapping of my supply chain say, so, yeah, I mean, I paint all the notes and then the flows and then you have a, a diagram, but it's so important to be able to do that, especially when you get so many complex um, settings of your supply chain. And also when you're trying to define what your supply chain actually is, right? Many people start from manufacturing all the way to the end customer, but in reality, if you map it all completely, then you go all the way to the supplier, to your supplier and the customer of your customer. And there's a lot more understanding of things that you can do to, to make a big impact. So just wanted to leave um, those two two ideas there. I, I think that's fantastic, Carlos. So first, the point about the the joint designs, and then um, also collaborating with your competitors. I, I think that is just a bold, great idea to have that type of scale and have that type of industry impact. And then again, I think you have talked before about silos. Well, the the need to go all the way down to raw materials. Um, we, we found especially this year how critical that was. And I don't think by any means for many supply chains, that's a simple task, but I think it's a, a critical task. So, so thank you for that. I appreciate it, Carlos. I'll turn it over to Gert now. Yeah, uh, great stories. So um, I would love to learn more about some, some of the things you're telling about there, but that will be for another time. Um, I think um, what we do for our large corporate customers is, is typically onboard their entire supply chain. So, uh, you know, tens of thousands of companies across uh, today live in more than 150 countries. So I think what we were all about when we started the company was to say we have to use a different approach to onboard suppliers if we want to reach uh, a higher level of digitization and supply chains in, in kind of our, our lifetime. So that's also why I think it's not about technology in reality. And I'm saying that although we are a technology company, I think it's about what are the incentives that you give to people to join digitization. So, so I think Jason, your comment about, you know, going the partnership way and say, you know, how, how can we actually help you? I think, I think that's, that's just spot on because everybody will ask what's in it for me. And when we speak, 
uh, to those companies. A lot of places, what we see is that, well, they focus on a few uh, high volume suppliers. They focused on a few categories. Uh, reports that come in can be on a half yearly or yearly basis. The most common form is huge PDF reports or Excel sheets. And that just doesn't give you the visibility to drive any real change because the moment you are being held accountable for what you're investing to drive change in that supply chain, it, it doesn't work to say that, that we will understand the impact of this uh, six months, 12 months from now. So I think one of the things we're helping people with is really the step one, which is mobilization. So basically the strategy we have moved to, to get people onboarded to things like electronic ordering and invoicing, using more like marketing campaign techniques, it's actually the same you need when you want to onboard uh, people to start sharing, for example, their carbon footprint or their ethical work practices or something like this. And if you start having that conversation, well, not about how good or exact are your models that are running this, but how are you going to mobilize your supply chain? That becomes a completely different conversation because, and I think this is really the source of it. It's really garbage in, garbage out. If you don't get the data-driven insight, you everything after that process is, is slowly going to rot a little bit. And, and one of the examples I, I met uh, with the founder of a company called Normative. So they do carbon footprinting. And uh, the founder of this company, he's a, actually a mathematician and philosopher by education. Uh, he joined the Oxford Center for Humanities. And he said, like, this is all very interesting. But if I'm going to make an impact, it seems you know, we're going to turn this commercial and we're going to look into what are the company uh, records that exist. So he, he turned his love on ERP systems. So what they're basically doing is, is uh, digging out everything, invoices, purchase orders, uh, requests, and then mapping that to the best databases that exist out there. So that's one of the things where we just joined forces and said, what if we help you get that application out as broadly as possible in the supply chain, even the extended supply chain? And what we help with, that is actually sharing that data across the participants. Uh, then it becomes really interesting because then you can use that kind of insight to, to, um, uh, to drive your reporting and you can invest in doing it fact-based, you can invest in, in doing the checks afterwards. And maybe that's, that's the second point where I think our focus, we are not uh, sustainability experts, but we are facilitators. And that means we can invite the best of breed uh, partnerships onto that platform. And I think it's much like, like the smartphone, like you don't care what is the app you want on your smartphone. What really matters is how you share information between those apps. You share videos, files, and uh, contacts. Um, but that's not always quite how, how enterprise software and, and supply chain works. So, so, so that's one of the kind of mindset changes we are trying to drive. And, and then maybe finally mentioning, so, We've been doing supply chain financing, early payments since since uh, 2014-15. And I think we know that that funds that have signed the, the UN principles for responsible investment combined, they have a $90 trillion uh, of assets on, on the management. So it also seems straightforward to reward the companies that actually want to share insights, for example, into their, their carbon footprint on a data-driven basis uh, with access to, to cheaper finance and early payments. Um, which, which is a win-win situation for those participating in the network and, and the buyers as well. Excellent. Thank you, Gert. So I'm actually going to stay with you as, as we continue to weave back and forth and have you talk a little bit about how you prioritize some of these different sustainability measures and if there's uh, any cases you want to discuss um, about trade-offs that are needed. Yeah. Um, I, I think, uh, Abe, you, you spoke a little bit about it, like if, if you look into large organizations that, that every part of the organization will have uh, a slightly variant of, of, you know, what's the definition of sustainability here. So I think we are not really in the business to say, just decide what is the best measure, but in, in creating that transparency. So, so one of the things, for example, we are looking to do, that is to say, when we get that kind of insight from the supply chain, from you know, live real-time invoice purchase orders, how can we share that within the organization? And, and, and one natural step is, is to plug that into, into the procurement portal or your internal marketplace in, into, in, in the enterprise. Because at least that, that gives every employee, and, and typically there are many thousand employees involved in, in purchasing decisions every day, 
and and I also think it's a little bit of a global trend to to democratize that that a little bit and break down the silo of the the, the chief procurement officer. I think bringing that kind of insight in as early as possible when you're making that spending decision, uh, even before requisitions are created, I think can help everybody everywhere make more informed decisions. And in the end, I think it's it's about that. If you change your spend, uh, you're basically changing the organization, you're changing your supply chain. And if you can empower everybody to uh, to make more information, uh, informed decisions about how, how they spend, um, you're actually affecting a change in that way. Excellent. Thank you, Gert. I appreciate it. So we're going to go back to Laura now uh, with the same question about uh, prioritization and uh, potentially any trade-offs. Okay. All right. So, so first of all, I want to say, you know, our business is, is a bit particular in the fact that we are, we, we created, designed this business of pooling being circular from the beginning. So it is in our culture um, for the last 40 years here in North America, um, and it's part of who, who we are, right? So how, how do we do things? Has sustainability at the core? It's part of our employee value proposition. It's part of our purpose. So it does motivate us, uh, all of us employees of the company to work for a company that actually is doing their bit to positively protect uh, nature resources and, and, and communities. But going to, to the question about how we measure, let's get practical with it. Um, each release of our uh, five-year sustainability targets, what we do is we integrate those performance metrics into our business and, and communicate those. We report out um, all the monitoring and measuring of this in our um, annual reports and in our sustainability reports. And, uh, and we have very specific KPIs, data-driven KPIs, as we were talking before, um, in different parts of the business. So for example, you know, procurement would have the 100% the certified sustainable source and an increase in chain of, in chain of custody for timber, for example. Uh, and, and we do that with, with a number of the metrics. Um, and we're pr proud to say that you know, by doing that, we have actually achieved um, our, our stretch goals. And we're now in a position to set ourselves even higher targets uh, for 2025. So starting already this year, what we did was launch a process where every single strategic initiative as a business that we undertake must report on its impact on our sustainability targets, on our 2025 sustainability targets. So that we make sure that everything we do goes back to that you know, center, all right? So meeting those sustainability targets. Uh, we also maintain um, life cycle analysis for each product that we have. So all, all of our portfolio of products. And that helps us um, understand and track uh, the positive impact of the products themselves and the business model that we have, but not only for us, also for our customers and our supply chain partners. And, and we find that many of our customers actually um, use us as, as, as a credential as well uh, in their own sustainability journey. Um, and we then um, uh, want to validate, so when we monitor and track all these data-driven uh, metrics, uh, we, we measure them externally and we have them validated externally um, uh, uh, before we report them out. Uh, we also partner with our customers, clearly. We want to learn what their sustainability goals are and that's part of the work that we're doing together under the Zero Waste World um, program. Uh, and we want to continue um, accelerating those collaborations. I said, you know, we have an objective to double the number of, of customer collaborations uh, for Zero Waste World uh, by 2025. Uh, there's one thing that you know, always, I guess, and it's part of this question, right? So many times I hear people um, questioning or, or being concerned about what is the cost of uh, being sustainable, right? So, so that's, that's, that's a big question. Uh, at least for us at Chip at Brambles, we actually believe that sustainability can, can make financial sense, long-term for sure. Um, it does not have to be profit versus plan. It's, that's not a war. It, ha it can be both. So if you just look at one simple example, the one that I was giving at the beginning about the, the war on empty miles, there's 50 billion empty miles um, every year in the US alone. That means we have a $90 billion saving opportunity if we in the industry really make a concerted effort and collaborate to eliminate them. It's a lot of money right there. So, um, I guess as a business, we uh, prioritize sustainability, we're committing our resources, uh, and we're moving from being neutral 
to being regenerative. We want to lead the way in the next five years. Um, and what we're doing is we're committing to reducing um, our supply chain carbon emissions in line with the, with the 1.5 degree Celsius future. Uh, with net zero operations, as I said before, we want to draw down carbon from the atmosphere and we're going to do that uh, with initiatives, uh, afforestation initiatives. Uh, so we're going to add millions and millions of trees uh, by 2025. So that's us. Thank you, Laura. Really, really great to hear. Um, Abe, can you talk a little bit from an ASCM point of view of how you help support uh, company prioritization? Yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting question because as we you know, are, are learning here, uh, sustainability means a lot of different things to organizations. But first and foremost, it has to be economic. If, you don't, if you're not sustainable economically, obviously a lot of the other metrics and a lot of the other performance indicators aren't going to be as critical for your organization if you're not in business. But given that it's a priority, where is the organization's focus in terms of its talent and in terms of its leadership within sustainability? And I think this is where we've seen a little bit of movement, but not enough. And that is chief sustainability officers or chief climate change officers within the organization having specific responsibility for the implementation and collaboration with their supply chain professionals, with their sales teams, with their R&D. And I think this is where I think the next evolution for sustainability in a climate change needs to take place. And that is having individuals within the organization have specific responsibility for the implementation and outcomes of sustainability measures for the organization. Too often you see it spread across the organization. It may be in ops, it may be in finance, it may be in a variety of different functions within the organization. I think we need to elevate the role and responsibility of sustainability and climate change within an organization. And I think once you start to do that, you'll start to see uh, alignment. And again, back to the discussion that we were having before about organizational learning and implementation responsibility and accountability have to reside within the leadership of the organization. And unfortunately, we're not seeing it at the C-suite just yet. I think this is where organizations can make a substantial difference in their organization is identifying the role, responsibility, and then hiring qualified and competent sustainability officers, as well as climate change officers, and then working with their supply chain teams across the enterprise to implement. I think that will go a long way to enable organizations to overcome a lot of the challenges on sustainability measures and accountability. Thank you, Abe. That was terrific. So Jason, I, I'm sure everyone would love to hear what you have to share about some of your process of prioritization as you continue to set these goals. Yeah, it's great. I think it's actually one of the, the most challenging areas that we have. And why is that? It's because there's a lot of great initiatives that we can pursue, but we need to make sure that we're prioritizing the resources. So I think there's a lot of great things that we can do uh, but that prioritization is what comes down to the leadership and how companies you know, react to it and say, hey, here's what we're going to be and here's what we stand for. From a Hershey standpoint, you know, we really go through materiality assessments you know, every two to three years. And this, this involves you know, looking at it from stakeholders, you know, both internal and external to the organization. And it's pretty broad you know, uh, slice of the universe as far as stakeholders. So it'll include... Uh, people and organizations like activists, civil societies, you know, our suppliers, customers, uh, and also making sure that we have the understanding from you know, investors. I think someone said that earlier around you know, you're seeing the, the increase you know, from the investor community as well as, as far as pushing this. And then we actually you know, work through that and uh, look at the decision and how it impacts the decision of the stakeholders, as well as the impact to the organization and beyond you know, the organization that these issues can have. And that helps us establish, you know, where the, the key priorities are and then how we outline, you know, the activities that we're going to go after. When we step back and look at some of the key issues, you know, that we face, uh, one of the ones that, you know, comes to the top are areas like, you know, cocoa. And that really involves, you know, three different areas that fall under that, that we could call sustainability, you know, deforestation, uh, child labor, and then uh, farmer uh, livelihoods, and they're really all you know interconnected. Uh, so you really need to make sure that you're working with all the, those stakeholders. You know, another one is obviously the environment. I do think that the the environment is the defining issue 
of this generation. And, you know, there's a huge opportunity to make sure that you're leveraging uh, your people. We often talk about our people being our, our biggest, you know, assets in the organization. And one of the things that, that we have launched are these green teams, which is really trying to harness the, the power and passion of our teams, every one of our employees around what are those initiatives that we can do and how can we make an impact, no matter how big or how small it is, you know, to the organization and really help propel us forward. And I think the last part of this is, you know, there has to be a lot more uh, transparency uh, around, you know, how you're establishing, uh, you know, these priorities and then reporting on how you're doing against, you know, the objectives that you set. And it does start at, you know, the board level, your, your management team, you know, has to be, you know, engaged in it. And it really starts to evolve then the whole culture of the organization. Fantastic. So Jason, I'm going to ask you to spend another minute and just briefly tell us what is your greatest challenge right now when it comes to sustainability in your supply chain? Yeah, one of the biggest ones we have is, is cocoa because, uh, you know, it's such a, you know, big, you know, part of, uh, you know, our, in, our ingredients uh, and the complexities, you know, there uh, involve you know, those different issues of deforestation, uh, the, the living, you know, wage, you know, for farmers, uh, as well as, uh, you know, child labor. And they're all, you know, interconnected. And when you start, you know, on the surface, you say, hey, this is, you know, an easy, you know, to solve and you can go after it. But as you start, you know, working down and peeling back, you know, you know what it's taken, what's going to be needed. Uh, so if you're looking at, well, maybe you need to build schools uh, so, you know, children, you know, can be in schools. Uh, you know, then it, and you get a school bill, then, you know, then it's about, well, what does that programming look like? You know, do you have teachers, you know, that are, that are coming? You know, do you have, you know, all the other materials uh, that are going to be needed? You know, do they have birth certificates to make sure that they can register, you know, for schools? You know, so the issues, you know, kind of really spread out and it becomes, you know, more complicated than just saying, hey, how do we make sure that, you know, we get, you know, children into schools, you know, which is where they need to be, you know, versus, you know, doing some of that, that labor on their, their family farms. So those are some of the Thank challenges. It's, it's rooted in Sorry. some of the, the poverty, uh, but it's you know making sure that you're changing that systemically, and you have to have holistic action plans that attack each one of those. Fantastic, thank you. I mean, and very admirable and incredibly complex. Uh, Abe, do you want to just quickly comment on your your greatest challenge at ASCM? Yeah, I think there are two areas. Uh, first, uh, the global nature of supply chains. Um, there are very few supply chains right now that are within a region. They are extensive and they are complicated. And I think this creates a challenge for sustainability, especially as we take a look at the where you source, where you manufacture, where you store, you deliver. So the complexity of supply chains has challenged a lot of the um, sustainability initiatives. But on the back side of it is the consumer and the patient expectations. Once we start to see expectations changing on consumers and their willingness to pay more for sustainable products, I think we'll see a sea change relative to the marketplace. But as long as we focus on just in time and low cost, fast delivery and anywhere, anytime uh, products, the expectation of the consumer on um, their, you know, their buying habits, uh, I think we're going to need to change those uh, perceptions. And I think there has to be a collective perspective on uh, sustainability. It's not a private enterprise responsibility. It is not a government responsibility. It is not a nonprofit responsibility. It's everybody's responsibility. And I think too often we're seeing it shoved to, you know, somebody else has to be accountable for this. It is collective responsibility that we see. And I think too often we're seeing the fragmentation of the, um, the supply chains based on demands of the patient and the consumer. I want it cheap, I want it now, and I want high quality. As long as those are the criteria, we're gonna be challenged on sustainability. We have a very functional and capable just-in-time system. We don't have a good just-in-case system of supply chain right now. So a lot of the expectations have to change on, and the perceptions have to change on sustainability. And this is holistic. It is not just one company. It is not just one government. It is not just one consumer. It encompasses all of it. Thank you, Abe. I appreciate it. Uh, briefly, let's go to Carlos. 
Hey, <clears throat> thank you. I, I just wanted to um, to add as a, as a challenges that we see with with our customers uh, a couple of things. One is the ability to be able to uh, portray or run uh, or um, create scenarios of different outcomes and of different trade-offs and to be able to look at that into the future. There's too many variables going on at the same time with high complexity in supply chains. So being able to look at those scenarios is gonna be key for that prioritization and decision-making. And it's currently one of the challenges. So how do you actually get enough information or the right information, the right metrics and the right participants to look at those scenarios and make decisions? And then the second challenge is, once you've already been able to do that, how do you democratize, to Gert's point before, how do you democratize this decision-making capability so that others can make those trade-offs in the operation and the tactical basis as well? So if everybody is aligned and doing that constantly, then we actually get this replicated effect into the, into the whole organization. So I think those, those two key challenges that we've identified, and in particular at Lamasoft, we've been uh, helping our customers with our sustainability program on tackling some of those to help with uh, the overall prioritization of those challenges. Uh, Laura, any closing comments? Okay, I'd say that in the interest of time, I'm gonna keep it very, very quick. I think for us, the biggest challenge is now to drive this agenda of regeneration. So we're happy with where we, we have uh, arrived in terms of neutrality, but really uh, the challenge ahead of us, all of us, I think for the planet, for humanity and for our businesses, quite frankly, uh, we have to act really, really fast and we really have to challenge ourselves to be bold in our aspirations, bold in our actions to actually move from neutral to regenerative. And, and, and I have a lot of reasons to be hopeful. I've, I've seen many companies already embrace that. You know, recently we heard from, uh, from Walmart talking about the regenerative agenda and committing to 2040 uh, zero emissions. We've, we've heard from big companies, Timberland, Nestle, and we are seeing movement with companies that are helping um, actually reduce waste from design, from the very design of products, um, design out, because we know that, that you know, 80% of that waste is created uh, at the design phase. So, uh, so that is happening and it gives us hope that actually moving beyond neutrality and into regeneration is possible. So as a company uh, at Brambles and Chip, we are very committed to achieving that. And uh, I just want to say thank you, Susan, and thank you to all the panelists because I found this, this conversation very, very inspiring. Thank you. I, I agree. Thank you. Uh, Gert, uh, closing comments, please. Yeah, so um, so in terms of challenges, I, I think there's one big, which is actually about, uh, and it might, might sound strange, but that, that that's about moving money in, in the supply chain. I think, Laura, you, you talked about knowing where your assets are. And I think if, if you look into the extended supply chains, that, that's, that's often a problem. Like when, when do things change hands and what, 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 what's the money that, that changes hand in that, um, in that situation. And, and we know that, you know, between 70, 60-ish uh, percent of all the credit needs in the world, they are, they are not covered by financing by banks, by traditional or institutional lending opportunities. So actually, I think I some of the goals of, the, of, of the um, supply chain challenges, which is about digitizing, I think has a lot of synergies with, with this agenda because um, if, you, if you can get uh, actually reward sellers that are driving a change, you can make a difference. And I think one of the big challenges today is you don't know where to invest in the supply chain. And I think the, these two challenges are, are very interlinked. If we look at, at like commodities and food, you have 1 billion smallholders that are producing 70% of, of what the, the, the world eats. And, and I'm like, of course we can get out to them. In, in a matter of a few years, we had e-commerce, social networks, cloud, bringing digitization in, into the hands of, of people and companies everywhere. So of course we can do it, but I think we have to think differently when we think about supply chain uh, digitization, we, we can't think of sending integration engineers out and, and building EDI networks. We have, we have to change, change our mind there and then think about how we, can we get the value back out and, and not just think about what, what we are receiving. Thank you, Gert. So I want to really thank all of our participants today and those who will be watching it after the fact and our very esteemed uh, panel that are, are very fully committed, very passionate about seeing this 
all come together now and in the future, setting these uh, audacious leadership goals uh, across multiple industries and taking on really highly complex, highly impactful uh, sustainability challenges. So thank you, Carlos. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Abe. And thank you, Gert. And as well, of course, thank you, Reuters, for hosting this event. And uh, hopefully we can take some of these conversations uh, offline to continue to learn from each other. Um, so with that, um, I wish everyone a good day. <laughs>